last year, I was sitting with a friend of mine, and he is starting an entrepreneurial endeavor. He got a retirement buyout. He is extremely intelligent in what he does, and he set up a computer system for controlling, comptrolling uh, liquor sales. And when you look at the system, you go, wow, that's, <laughs> that's cool and efficient. And while we were talking, he was talking that he would. He said that he had, would have to go out and make presentations. And one of his partners said to him, "Well, we don't want you making the presentations because you're not good at them." And he said, "I was pretty offended." Well, to you, Bill, the the only thing that matters is the bottom line, is the results. If you go out and make a presentation and you make sales or make a warm connection that leads to a sale. That's what matters. What anybody thinks about it is completely irrelevant. If your partners don't like how you present, say, okay, then watch the results. If I don't get the results, then, then you can pull me. But until then, if I keep bringing people in and I keep closing the sales and I keep getting customers, then I'm at, whether you like them or not, because it is not business is not about like or dislike. Now, we were in Texas. Uh, I was in practice. We were looking at buying a house. Uh, one of our clients had come from Hawaii and she was in real estate at the time. Uh, friend, patient, client, uh, Don Harris was a friend of mine. And Don was moving from his engineering job, I believe it was engineering, I'm not absolutely sure, into real estate. And he, is, he and his wife are going to go into real estate together. And so he was showing us houses. And we would walk into a house and Don would start talking. And we came out of one of the houses and this gal high-pressure high kind of person from Maui. Uh, I guess that's that's almost an oxymoron. <laughs> but uh, she said, he is the most boring man I've ever had to listen to. And I said, well, Don has been the top salesman in his office for the last six months, and he's only been in the office about eight months. And she said, oh, because all I look at is results. So I talked to Don, and I said, you know, I said, you ramble a lot when you show houses. Yeah, I do. I said, oh, it's conscious. He said, yeah, yeah, he said, I do. He said, I just tell stories and point out things in the house and things like that. He said, there's, there's no use t selling a person until you feel them move into the house. And he said, what I learned from Martin, Martin Sage, was women buy houses, men buy art and cars. And he said, I've learned to watch closely enough that when the woman decides that she wants the house, he said, then I'll start the sale. He said, but until then, it's not worth me trying to sell them because it's not their house. Don would watch the subtle energies. Uh, when my wife's father passed away, we had a mansion, basically, we had to sell. We brought in a professional negotiator. And uh, before we brought the professional negotiator in, the man who eventually bought the house and his wife came and looked at the house. And I had got some information beforehand that she had two children a little bit older than our first child and Mia was with us. Mia was, I don't know, 12 months, 13 months, little. Uh, we didn't have Micah yet so uh, she was still in diapers and behind this house in the Dolder area of Zurich, which is a hoity-toity area, a little train went right behind the house, right? A little cog wheel train that just kind of, you know, they they keep level all the way up the hill and a wire pulls them up and I heard this train coming through, and I, and I stood up, and I said, Mia, say goodbye to your train. I said, this is going to be another little kid's train now, and they get to have this as their play train in their backyard. And energetically, it felt to me like the wife moved into the house. It just felt like she looked around, and it was hers. It became hers. A few weeks later, maybe a few days later, maybe a few weeks, some of the timelines get blurry. I was talking to our negotiator, and he said, you know, he said, I know that he's nibbling around the hook. He said, but I, he said, I can't get the hook set. And I said, I'll set it tomorrow. He said, what? I said, I'll set the hook for you tomorrow. <laughs> he said, will you? And I said, yep. I said, when we're going tomorrow. The house had to sell with furniture and art. And this buy, guy was buying a lifestyle. He was buying my father-in-law's lifestyle, which was exorbitant. He loved life and lived it fully. And so I said, tomorrow we're going to the warehouse where the art and furniture is. I said, once he gets there, I said, and I hit those buttons, 
I said, he won't. I said, I will set the hook tomorrow. I guarantee it. <laughs> he started laughing. He said, I like the way you think. The next day, or two days later, they were in negotiations around the final points of the sale. I walked in late to negotiations. I made it a point to stay out of it because I can really mess things up sometimes. And I walked into the house where the negotiations were going on. And our negotiator turned and said, he's agreed to, and he gave me a number. And I thought, man, why aren't we opening the champagne? <laughs> but they went on to buy the house. Uh, if you know little tidbits, if you can get out of your own way, if you can uh, learn to respond to situations, watch situations, watch what Buckminster Fuller says is the 90% of energies that is the communication that's invisible. It'll help your sales, it'll help your teamwork, and that's a lot of what we work on in the seminars, is those invisible areas so you can start to see the things that are valuable. Have fun. www.micpeakperformance.com